special to you? What makes Brenna special? Yeah. Uh, let's see. We have a kosher bakery in San Francisco proper. In the heart of San Francisco. There's no other kosher bakery out in the Bay Area. Not even an open. Uh, it's right across the street from the Shul, which is amazing. I'm just going to say, I'm going to say, Not a fun, popular spot. It's been here several. The shore of the bakery of looking over the neighborhood. Hi, Shalom. Welcome. I'd like to welcome everyone here to uh, Freda Bakery. First of all, I want to thank Freda for hosting us here tonight. <laughs> Um, just a few quick announcements. Um, uh, we're going to have a speaker in just a few minutes. Um, after that, we have a Shabbat dinner um, and Shabbat services. It's going to be across the street um, on the Thomas Street at the Chabad Center across the street on the Thomas Street. I'm always welcome to join us for that. Now, uh, Monday night is Tisha B'Av. It's the ninth of Av. Uh, we commemorate the destruction of the temple. We'll be having a special event and movies, uh, a documentary screening on Monday night um, at 8.30 8 p.m. at the Chabad Center. We'll be showing a film, a documentary film called Keep Quiet. It's a story about a Hungarian politician uh, that was very involved in an anti-Semitic party, later discovers that he's Jewish, and you know his, his entire story takes place. Um, it's a fascinating story. You're welcome to join us Monday night at, at Chabad at 8.30 p.m. Okay? And now today we have a special guest speaker here with us. Um, it's a dear friend. Um, we met through, um, his name is Cliff Weitzman. Hello. Now we met through, um, actually through his brother, um, uh, uh, Tyler. Tyler, sorry. Tyler, uh, we actually, uh, we live in a building in Lima on 10th and Mark, and we were, we were uh, just in the elevator. We bumped into each other in the elevator. He was all stressed out. He had to go to Israel. He was looking for, he had to get his passport done and all that. Um, I connected him with some, someone in the Israeli consulate, figured things out. Next thing you know, uh, that day is it's Friday, Friday night there. I came and his brother come over for dinner. We had a great Shabbat dinner together at our home. Uh, got to hear some of his story. Um, and it's a pleasure and honor to have him here with us today. Please welcome, ladies and gentlemen, Cliff Weitzman, CEO and founder of Speechify. Uh, all right, we don't have any pressure, we'll get this done. Um, <laughs> no problem, so no bad looks now. Uh, thank you, Shmuley. Thank you, Chabad and Freda, for hosting us here. Um, it's really wonderful to be out here. Um, yeah, so Shmuley and I met relatively recently, but he's an amazing person, and I'm glad to be here with all of you. He thought my story was interesting enough to share, so uh, I thought I'd share. Um, I moved to SF about six months ago, so not long ago. Originally, I'm from Israel. Um, I grew up in Ranana. I moved to Marin, not far away from here, when I was 13, and then went to Brown for school. And so I just finished school there. Um, when I was at Brown, I built a lot of products. So I started off building an attachable brake for longboards and skateboards, and then I built a payments company, and then I built a biotech supplement, and a cell phone radiation shield, and a solar cell. I like building stuff. Um, and then I got more into building iPhone apps and websites. And towards graduation, I was trying to figure out what to work on full time after I graduated. So, okay, do I take a job here? Do I take a job here? Do I do my own thing? And I couldn't figure out what I wanted to do. But one thing that I learned during my time in school um, are the values that are important to me. And so one of the things that was most important to me was to create value in the world. And a lot of the things that I was considering doing didn't allow me to do that effectively enough. And so I was trying to figure out what could I do that would maximize the amount of value that I created in the world. Because from reading philosophy, from doing stuff, I figured that that's the thing that actually drove me the most. And it took me a lot of thought, but I was like, okay, this is the, this is the thing that I want to optimize for. Um, and so what I ended up doing is decided that I was going to take a deep breath and engineer my life to give myself space to figure out what the most effective thing for me to spend my time on would be. So I convinced two professors at Brown to let me stay at Brown for another year. I took a job over the summer teaching instead of working as a software engineer or as an investment banker or anything like that. Um, and that job gave me enough money to support myself to pay rent and food for a year in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, and then I just started building more things. 
um, and looked at every problem that I had in my life, that other people had in their lives, and tried to solve them. And the other side to the story is I'm like super dyslexic. Like to the point where when I was little, the one thing I wanted to do the most is read Harry Potter. And no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't do it. I would fall asleep every time. And so my dad took pity on me and he took Harry Potter and he read it and recorded himself doing so on a cassette tape. And I would walk around our house in Israel listening to my dad reading Harry Potter and he was. Um, and I really, really liked the story. And so before I moved to the United States, I didn't speak English at the time, my dad got me an audiobook of Harry Potter in English. And I didn't know English at the time, but I listened to it anyway, and I understood what was going on because my dad had read it to me. And I listened to it 22 times in a row. And so when I moved to the US, I actually had a British accent, because Jim Dale reads the book with a British accent. Um, to this day, I have the first chapter of Harry Potter memorized. But I kept being obsessed with audiobooks after this experience. And so even though I couldn't really read well, I would go through two books a week, because I would listen to so many audiobooks. And so I did all of high school without actually opening a sex book, got to Brown, found the system of not really reading for your schoolwork didn't work as well. So I built software that let my computer read out everything to me. When I was trying to figure out what to work on full time, uh, there was a big shift that happened with the application of artificial intelligence to text to speech that made the software that I worked on a little bit more effective. And I was like, you know, other people could benefit from this too. So I made a video to teach other people how to use the software that I built. And I was like, I literally made this before dinner at home on my bed. And my mom was like, oh, fake. And he wrote my name, oh, fake. Oh, fake. What are and so I was like, okay, I gotta finish this. So I like quickly posted it to YouTube and went upstairs. It didn't touch it for like two years. And then came back and saw that it had like 40,000 people had watched it, 200 people commented, and I had multiple people who said stuff like, I'm literally crying. My nine year old can actually read now. Like, this is amazing. Um, and that was a dumbed down version of the thing that I built. And so I was like, well, now I have a more fancy version. Let's see what happens. And so I snuck into a dyslexia conference and gave an impromptu speech, very similar to this one, um, about what I was working on. Um, and 15 of the school heads, for some reason, decided to fly me out to teach their kids how to use speech flying. Um, and then ended up getting lucky enough to recruit a team of other people to work with me. Um, six months later, um, I'm here in San Francisco, um, presenting in a bakery, a <laughs> um, And so I think the moral of the story for me is the fact that very often it's hard to stick to our values. And uh, we we'll talk about Jewish values or personal values, really the things that are important to you. Um, and there's been pivotal points in my life where life was moving so fast that I had to make a decision and I didn't really feel like I could make a decision except for like the options that were given to me. And none of those fit my values well enough. Um, and especially in those moments, we feel like we don't have the agency to stop and figure out what we want to do. What we actually do, all it takes is taking a deep breath and seeing if there's another path. Maybe you can engineer a year to do whatever you want, just cut back, don't live in San Francisco, or spend less money, you live in a shack, which is kind of what I did, um, until you figure out what, what, what really drives you and what you can really spend your time on. Um, and when you do that, not only do you end up working on things that excite you, but you end up meeting people that you didn't think you would ever meet, uh, and being in wonderful situations, like this one here, across the world from where I was, uh, in a really wonderful Israeli bakery, all the way in San Francisco. Thank you. Thank you.